Good morning, everyone, and thank you to our witnesses for testifying before our committee today. I would like to thank Chairman Casco for his leadership on regional issues for joining me in holding this hearing. Just over a year ago, Vice President Harris launched our call to action to support economic development in the Northern Triangle. This initiative, which leverages the strength of the private sector, is part of the Biden administration's strategy to address root causes of migration from El Salvador, Guatemala, and Honduras. It focuses on connecting businesses with U.S. government partners, such as the U.S. Agency for International Development and the U.S. International Development Finance Corporation, as well as international organizations and government officials from the region. Through these pub public-private partnerships, the call to action seeks to ensure sustainable and effective progress that builds on past lessons to address focus areas that often serve as push factors for movement. Today's hearing is timely. Earlier this month, at the ninth, ninth summit of the Americans in Los Angeles, stakeholders from various sectors came together to discuss policy issues and collaborate on new and continuing challenges the focus of the summit was building a sustainable and resilient and equitable future, a topic that holds particular importance in the wake of the COVID-19 pandemic, which fueled this in our regional system. Many conversations centered on how to improve our hemispheric economy and invest in ways that improve overall quality of life while building more resilient and confronting systemic challenges that have far-reaching consequences. As we've seen over the past few decades, issues that originate in one part of our hemisphere rarely stay there. The rise in irregular migration is a direct consequence of these underlying issues. Throughout my time in Congress and my tenure as chairman of the Western Hemisphere, Western Hemisphere Subcommittee, I have worked with colleagues from both parties as well as multiple administrations, foreign governments, and other stakeholders to address the root causes of migration from Central America. The hundreds of thousands of Salvadorians, Guatemalans, Hondurans, who embark on the dangerous journey towards our southern border are increasingly driven by desperation and fear. Most of those making the journey know that the trip is dangerous and being granted admission to the United States is unlikely. But it remains the better option compared to the risks present in their home countries. El Salvador, Guatemala, and Honduras are all struggling with the legacy of inequality, and widespread poverty and economic reforms have not led to drastically improved living conditions for many in the region. Population projections for all three countries show an unexpected growth of working age individuals in the coming years. As 42% of Hondurans and 45% of Guatemalans are currently under the age of 20. However, as these individuals enter the workforce, the lack of stable economic opportunities will contribute to economic hardship and leave many individuals without a means to provide for themselves or their families. Climate change is deepening the precarious socioeconomic situation, as those in poverty are also the most vulnerable to the impacts of climate crisis. These are complicated, multifaceted challenges that put people to leave their homes. We will not be able to solve them quickly or without collaboration across various sectors. Long-term development requires a sustained investment for more than just the United States government and other international bodies. Businesses and nonprofits are and will continue to be important partners Private investment and business development in the region will play a key role in increasing economic 
opportunities and improving overall quality of life. I am grateful that the Biden administration's strategy not only includes such collaboration, but seeks to mobilize private sector and investment. Vice President Harris' dedication in addressing the root causes of migration is commendable, and we have seen impressive pledges in response to her call to action. Two weeks ago, Vice President Harris announced more than $1.9 billion in new private sector commitment, commitments to create economic opportunity in the Northern Triangle. Forty companies and organizations have announced major commitment since the launch, bringing the total since the launch, bringing the total amount to more than $3.2 billion. It is important to emphasize that these commitments are not charity. These are major co corporate players indicating that they have faith in the future of Central America. We want to create the conditions for sustainable, equal, equitable economic growth in the Northern Triangle. In order to do so, we must ensure that these commitments are executed in a manner that delivers capital, logistical coordination, and quality jobs for these countries. Additionally, we must ensure that there are mechanisms in place to counter corruption while protecting and supporting community economies, marginalized population, and workers so that short-term gains do not create new challenges and push factors for migration. Our witnesses today are equally, equally qualified to testify on public-private collaboration on development initiatives, the opportunity as well as challenges in the region, and how we can best support efforts that raise up vulnerable population and reduce the push factors of migration. Although we cannot expect any administration or business investment in the Northern Triangle to reap immediate gains, it is important that we regularly review progress made. Today's hearing presents us with the opportunity to work together across party and sector to examine the, advance, the investments of the Vice President's call for action and the role that private investment can have as part of our response to the root causes of migration from Central America. Thank you again for coming and for what I hope will be an extremely productive hearing. I will now recognize Ranking Member Green for opening remarks. Thank you, Chairman Sirius and uh, Chairman Castro, Ranking Member Maliotakis for holding this joint hearing. And I want to thank our witnesses for being here today. Uh, first, I'd like to take a moment to highlight a matter that is near and dear to my heart, the unlawful detention of Tennessee resident Matthew Heath. For almost two years, this U.S. Marine veteran has been held hostage in Venezuela. As, as a result of his mistreatment and torture by the socialist Maduro regime, he actually attempted to take his own life this weekend. I'm praying for his health, and I urge President Biden to do all possible to bring Matthew home. Ever since the Biden administration enacted its open borders agenda, we've seen a surge in illegal migration at our southern border. Under President Biden, Border encounters continue shattering records. Last month alone, illegal border crossings hit a record high of over 239,000 encounters. And this doesn't count the people who go around CBP. Watering down the mig migrant protection protocols, threatening to end Title 42 expulsions, and limiting border wall construction amounts to increasing the pull factors leading to skyrocketing illegal migration. We've seen heartbreaking stories in the media of the real-life consequences of these reckless policies. Border Patrol agents rescuing drowning children in the Rio Grande, sexual assaults of women and children by traffickers, and forcible recruitment of migrants into crime. To say nothing of the fentanyl crisis and the hundreds, thousands of Americans who've died to overdose. While the Biden administration refuses to address illegal immigration's pull factors, such as our broken immigration system, there is an opportunity for bipartisan solutions to some of the push factors. 
One of these push factors is the lack of economic opportunity in migrants' countries of origins. This hearing on private investment provides an excellent opportunity to address this critical issue and to jumpstart our joint efforts with our Western Hemisphere counterparts to create more jobs for their citizens and investment opportunities for American companies. However, there has been a growing sense of hostility by Latin American governments toward the private sector, which is the engine of job creation. We've seen Mexico discriminating against the American private sector, Honduras pass a bill to repeal its special economic zones, and others threaten, nation threaten to nationalize key sectors like mining. This has got to change. If countries want to create more jobs, they must create business-friendly environments. Through U.S. leadership, I'm hopeful that we can reverse some of these unfortunate developments. I'm willing to work with any government in the Western Hemisphere that respects the rule of law and market-driven models of economic growth. These are the nations that will attract private investment, create long-term, sustainable jobs for their citizens. One of the best ways to help increase economic opportunities for our southern neighbors is through nearshoring. According to estimates by the Inter-American Development Bank, IDB, nearshoring could add an annual $78 billion in additional exports of goods and services in Latin America and the Caribbean in the near and midterm. To put this into perspective, in 2020, Guatemala's GDP was estimated to be roughly $77.6 billion. Such a huge influx of capital from nearshoring would mean massive growth in concent if concentrated in smaller countries like Guatemala. The IDB recommends countries focus on a 3I strategy, investment, infrastructure, and integration. Investment meaning creating a business-friendly environment, not scaring companies away with hostile rhetoric of nationalization. Infrastructure means building and repairing the roads, bridges, seaports, airports, and energy grids necessary for business to flourish. And integration, of course, involves increasing and harmonizing trade agreements to reduce the regulatory patchwork that currently exists between countries. My bill, the Western Hemisphere Nearshoring Act, co-led by Chairman Saris, assisted in the writing by members of the State Department, people from both sides of the aisle, addresses all of the three I's. It, is, it addresses investment through ultra-low interest DFC loans while urging countries to reduce bureaucratic red tape, streamline permitting, and embrace free market principles. It helps address infrastructure by providing technical assistance for energy grids and streamlining the application process for nuclear reactors. And it addresses integration by directing the U.S. Trade Representative to obtain trade agreements with our Western Hemisphere allies with whom we do not currently have trade agreements. The bill is a win-win-win. It makes our supply chain less vulnerable to communist China. It will create more jobs and economic growth for Latin America and the Caribbean. And as opportunities increase in the Western Hemisphere, the nearshoring of manufacturing will decrease migration to the United States southern border. I urge all of my colleagues to co-sponsor this bipartisan, common-sense bill, and I hope Chairman Meeks will schedule it for a full committee markup soon. Private investment is the key to addressing the lack of economic opportunity in many Latin American and Caribbean countries. If governments embrace the rule of law, respect human rights, and private property, and if Democrats and Republicans can work together, we can tackle one of the most significant push factors to the surging migration at our southern border. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I yield. Thank you, Ranking Member. I will now recognize Chair Castro for his opening remarks. Uh, thank you, Chairman Cetus, and good morning, everybody. I'm glad to be co-chairing this important meeting with Congressman and Chairman Cetus. Uh, there's no sugarcoating that we're at a crucial moment in our hemisphere's history. Migration in the Americas has risen dramatically over the past decade due to deteriorating economic and humanitarian conditions and increased violence, crime, and corruption. The effects of the COVID-19 pandemic and the two back-to-back -back hurricanes in 2020 have only worsened already dire situations in Central America. <clears throat> U.S. government agencies reported encountering more than one million migrants along the U.S.-Mexico border in 2021, with most arrivals coming from Mexico, Honduras, Guatemala, and El Salvador. Data shows that conditions on the ground are not improving and continue to drive the desire to migrate. The World Justice Project reports that almost half of the Hondurans who want to, that almost half of Hondurans want to migrate to another country, with 18 percent having active plans to do so within the next year. This urgency to migrate is also high in El Salvador and Guatemala. 
While one of the main motivations for migration remains economic opportunity, the deterioration of the rule of law has given many no choice but to flee, with the number of migrants encountered at the border from Venezuela, Nicaragua, Haiti, and Cuba increasing in recent months. These trends emphasize the important need to not only increase economic opportunity as a key root cause, but to also address the insufficient systems and institutions that have failed to provide protection and prosperity to millions in the region and have actively discriminated against the most vulnerable. Therefore, a holistic, inclusive approach to migration is needed. Before moving on to today's topic of conversation, the Vice President's call to action, I want to quickly note that the United States border policy must also work in complement with our efforts to address root causes of migration. Harmful immigration policies, such as Title 42 and the Remain in Mexico program, have failed in deterring migration flows and instead have fueled greater violence and xenophobic rhetoric. As we expand our international development work in Central America, private sector and partnerships can play a strong role in expanding economic opportunities in the region. Uh, at the same time, our relationship and the relationship of American corporations to the people of these nations must also be fair, just, and equitable. In May 2021, Vice President Kamala Harris announced the Call to Action, which helped launch the Public-Private Partnership for Central America. This collaboration provides an innovative approach with the potential to improve economic conditions and contribute to overall stability in the region. These commitments by 40 companies, totaling $3.2 billion to address root causes of migration, are an important start, but we must make sure that they result in sustainable impact and inclusive economic growth. In making these investments, I believe that we should not only strive to bring more workers into the formal economy and increase access to digital financing, but we must also ensure that everyone, especially the vulnerable and often disenfranchised, are able to benefit from such investments. This is why I hope that any private investment is paired with strong anti-corruption measures, increased wages, and protections uh, in labor and environmental rights. Furthermore, to truly succeed, this partnership in our government must engage with local actors. The Biden administration's focus on addressing root causes of migration through humanitarian and foreign assistance is an important piece of the solution, but so is engaging with local and national actors. I worked with my colleague on, colleagues on HVAC and in appropriations to secure funding for our foreign assistance programs, and most importantly, for our locally-led development efforts, including Central America Local, a new and important USAID initiative to address root causes of migration. I was also glad to attend the Summit of the Americas earlier this month and to continue my work with civil society to elevate local voices and include key provisions in the Declaration of Migration and Protection. We already know that partnering with local actors makes assistance more effective, more sustainable, and more equitable. The impact of the commitments by members of the VP's call to action can and will be strengthened when local actors, including civil society organizations, entrepreneurs, indigenous communities, and others are included in investment projects from the beginning. Private sector and investment alone will not stem migratory flows. As I've always said, the United States international development capabilities include a strong coordination between entities like USAID, DFC, and the State Department, as well as NGOs and the private sector. Therefore, coordination among these entities is not only beneficial, but essential to make a difference. I look forward to hearing from the witnesses on their work and how Congress and the U.S. government can ensure our investments are creating long-lasting change. My hope is that this hearing serves not as a one-off conversation, but as a starting point for continued engagement on the impact and results of this public-private partnership. And with that, I yield back to Chairman Cetus. Thank you. I would now recognize Ranking Member Meliotakis for her opening remarks. Uh, thank you, Chairman. Uh, first, I want to comment on the name of this hearing, uh, Progress in Vice President Harris's Call to Action. I think a, a better name for this hearing would be Regress, the Failure, the Utter Incompetence. People want to know why there's a problem at our border. Just look at the policies of this administration. They stopped the construction of the border wall. They stopped the Remain in Mexico policy that helped stem the flow and bring some order to the process. They attempted to end Title 42 
And even with court orders, I'm not sure that they're even following the law. In April 2021, when our border czar, VP Harris, announced $310 million in increased assistance to the Northern Triangle and Central America, what has happened since? It has only gotten worse. In April of 2021, when she made this announcement, there were 178,622 crossings. This past month, May, 239, 416. That is the highest ever recorded and about a 35% increase since when she became the border czar. We're on pace to break 2 million people illegally entering into our country this fiscal year. That is more than her home city of San Francisco and the president's home state of Delaware combined. This doesn't even include the Godaways, which is estimated to be at least hundreds of thousands of individuals. What's happening at our border? Well, 15 individuals on the terror watch list just in the month of May. In addition to these, that, that's a record-breaking number as well. That brings the total to 50 since October, at a time when we're facing threats from, from Russia, from China, from Iran, the an Iraqi man busted by federal agents who attempted to smuggle four ISIS-linked individuals across our border to kill the former president of the United States, George W. Bush. Fentanyl is streaming over our border. The DEA, CBP, they'll tell you, tons of fentanyl streaming over our border, and it is that, not COVID, that is the number one killer of Americans 18 to 45 years old. Look at these headlines from CBS News. Police find fentanyl pill press in Mexican town near U.S. border. CBS, border agents arrest women smuggling fentanyl to Texas. New York Post, Mexican cartels exploiting border chaos to smuggle fentanyl into the U.S. ABC News, the fentanyl trip, how the drug is coming to America, and CBP's own press release. Over a 48-hour period, San Diego U.S. Border Patrol agents seized over 1.5 million worth of, worth of narcotics. That was this month on June 1st, that press release. So I ask, why does this administration continue to put the drug cartels ahead of the American people? That is the question that we should be asking at this hearing. In April, a Texas National Guardsman, Bishop Evans, drowned trying to save two migrants who, guess what, turned out to be drug traffickers. So I truly feel that that is what we should be focusing on in this hearing. We could talk about root causes, why people are coming. The question is, why do we allow drug trafficking, human trafficking, child trafficking to be, be it committed at our southern border? I went to the border last year, and if you see these children, they're crying. They don't want to be separated from their parents and come here alone. Who knows what their future is here, if it's into a sex trafficking ring? We know what's occurring. Talk to law enforcement about the sex trafficking, the child trafficking that is happening. And I don't know how you find that to be compassionate to the people. It's not about just a better life like my parents came here as immigrants. These children, these people, they're being exploited. And the United States of America is allowing it to happen. And it has to end. And that's what we should be talking about today. And I hope somebody actually addresses that issue. Thank you, and I yield back. Thank you for your comments. I will now introduce our witness, Ms. Salina De Sola, co-founder and president of Class One International. Ms. Salina De Sola is a co-founder and president of Class One International, a Salvadorian organization that addresses the root causes and consequences of poverty and violence through public education, health, and community empowerment in 10 countries in Latin America and the Caribbean. Ms. De Sola has over 25 years of experience in international development and social change. Before Glasswin, she was a crisis interventionist for Latino immigrants in the U.S. Worked as a consultant for international organizations and subsequently spent six years leading responses to complex humanitarian crises in countries such as Liberia, Sudan, Afghanistan, Iraq, and Indonesia. Ms. De Sola 
We welcome you to the hearing. I ask the witnesses to please limit your testimony to five minutes, and without objection, your prepared written statements will be made part of the record. Ms. DeSola, you are recognized for your testimony. Thank you. Thank you for the opportunity to be here today. Mr. Chairman, I'll be summarizing my written statement. I'm Selena Sola, co-founder and president of Glasswing. And we specialize in positive youth development and leadership, social, emotional learning, economic opportunities, volunteering, and mental health. We work with young people facing extreme adversity, exposure to violence, trauma, stigma, and a lack of opportunity. Yet most of the young people we with want to be able to succeed and thrive in their communities and countries. For 15 years, we've been forging cross-sector partnerships to achieve a sustained impact. And our partnerships have included both multinational and Central American corporations. USAID's support to the through the Global Development Alliance has actually been key in engaging and leveraging additional corporate funding. For example, we've partnered with Haynes Brands for 12 years to provide students with safe spaces and life skills development in the communities surrounding Haynes' operations, and hundreds of their employees volunteer. We've worked with City Foundation since 2011, developing students' life skills, financial and entrepreneurial capabilities. And we've worked with Dutch Brothers Coffee from Oregon, which has supported our work with rural coffee-producing communities to improve access to health care, English learning, violence prevention, and mental health. Last year, the Howard G. Buffett Foundation in Glasswing launched the Central American Youth Corps with an initial investment of $13.2 million provided exclusively by the foundation. This initiative is creating conditions for young people to see opportunity and a desirable future in their home communities. This year, USAID is also supporting the Service Corps initiative with funding that will enable Glasswing to lay the groundwork for a sustainable National Youth Service Corps in the region. Together with other technical assistance partners such as Peace Corps, Youth Build, City Year, and the Inter-American Foundation, on who did advisory council I'm proud to serve. The IAF also actively collaborates with the private sector, corporate and philanthropic in joint funding initiatives. Vice President Harris's call to action is a crucial step in mobilizing the private sector to create more opportunities for Central American youth as part of a broader strategy to address root causes. The key will be to turn these commitments into practical and impactful actions that provide opportunities for those who need it most. An ideal vehicle to do this is through the Central American Service Corps Initiative, which builds on the initiative that Glasswing launched with the Howard G. Buffett Foundation last year. The Partnership for Central America is also critical in this collaborative effort, mobilizing dozens of businesses from El Salvador, Guatemala, Honduras, and the U.S. who have already pledged to support this initiative. Working closely with local organizations and communities to channel these investments will help ensure that opportunities are provided for the young people that face the most adversity and are thus most at risk. At Glasswing, we found that one of the most important aspects of assessing the progress of any effort is understanding that progress does take time. Vice President Harris's call to action has undoubtedly generated momentum and much needed private sector commitments. And I believe that if these commitments are directly responsive to the needs and priorities of youth facing adversity, and if they're sustained over time, they will engender hope and provide opportunities. I also believe that civil society organizations can help build those bridges between young people, education employability program and employers. At the end of the day, more jobs don't necessarily mean more opportunities for everyone. Glasswing and local organizations can play a critical role in helping bridge the gaps between the expectations and needs of both businesses and young people. The following are our recommendations on how the U.S. government can capitalize on the current momentum from Vice President Harris's call to action. The Central American Service Corps presents an ideal opportunity to engage the private sector in addressing the root causes by providing, providing social and economic inclusion opportunities that are tiered and differentiated for different populations. More inclusive hiring practices could also help avoid discrimination based on educational level or where young people live. Working with the whole ecosystem, including youth themselves, we can provide or create the national architecture of opportunities for young people that have historically been excluded. And finally, companies should be motivated and incentivized to engage with local Central American civil society organizations as partners. As USAID Administrator Samantha Power recently said, Shifting to a model of locally led development means ceding power over decision making to those who know their problems best. Thank you very much, and I look forward to any questions you may have. I think you're muted, Chairman. Oh. Hello? Okay. 
Jonathan Fantini Porter is co-founder and executive director of the Partnership for Central America. The partnership is the coordinating body of the White House Public-Private Partnership, launched by Vice President Harris in May of 2021. Jonathan previously served as an associate partner at McKinsey and Company, national security aid in the White House, senior congressional aide in both chambers of the House, and as chief of staff in the U.S. Department of Homeland Security, where he always saw a management of a six million, six billion dollar budget and 22,000 personnel in 48 countries. Jonathan serves on advisory bodies to the UN Refugee Agency's U.S. entity and the World Economic Forum and Amnesty International. He is a consulting fellow at the London-based International Institute for Strategic Studies and graduate of the Harvard Kennedy School of Government and Georgetown University. Mr. Fantini Porter, we welcome you to the hearing. Chairman Castro, Chairman Ceres, Ranking Members Maliotakis and Green, and members of the committee, thank you for the opportunity to discuss the role of private sector investments in addressing the root causes of migration from Central America and progress in Vice President Harris's call to action. I'd like to begin by respectfully thanking both subcommittees for your support of economic development efforts around the world and in the context of this discussion of core Central America. In particular, thank you, Chairman Castro, for your leadership, and Chairman Ceres, Ranking Member Green, for your bipartisan action on nearshoring. As the UN Refugee Agency has documented, the humanitarian situation in Northern Central America has worsened considerably over the last five years. Refugee and asylum seekers from Guatemala, Honduras, and El Salvador have left their homes for a complex mix of factors. This is a region where nearly 30% live in extreme poverty, 50% of children suffer from chronic malnutrition and widespread stunting. Homicide rates have been the highest in the world, and 2.1 million individuals will be forced from their homes due to climate disaster in coming years. The Partnership for Central America is an independent, non-governmental organization that was established in May 2021 to mobilize private and social sector investments to address the structural factors contributing to these humanitarian challenges. Central to our work, PCA is advancing the call to action for Central America announced by Vice President Harris in partnership with the U.S. Department of State and U.S. Agency for International Development. Since our launch 12 months ago, in support of the call to action, PCA has helped secure commitments of more than $3.2 billion that we estimate will aid 21.2 million people across the region through digital access, financial inclusion, agricultural employment, and new manufacturing and textile jobs. Commitments include banking nearly 12 million people, digital inclusion for more than 4 million, manufacturing and textile commitments to create and nearshore jobs, and support small businesses in both Central America and the United States, and to train 250,000 youth, entrepreneurs, and small business owners in core skills to support labor productivity and workforce development. In our first year, these commitments have served nearly 2.5 million people directly across Central America, including internet access for 1.96 million families, banking 310,000 individuals, new agricultural and production sourcing from Honduras and El Salvador, and nearly $100 million in new investments across agricultural production. In just one illustration of our impact, children from a rural indigenous community of more than 4,000 in Comayagua, Honduras, are now able to access the internet, which connects these families to the global economy and creates a measurable potential for their lives. Looking forward, we are conscious of the many challenges that lay ahead in achieving our shared vision. Success will require sustained attention, adequate resources, political will across governments, strong and inclusive economic growth to go with strengthened governance and anti-corruption, and robust metrics and evaluation practices. As the son of a refugee who came to this country from Latin America, I am grateful for this committee's commitment for, to the protection of the most vulnerable families in our society, including those in Central America. As an entirely nonpartisan effort, 
We are focused on outcomes that grow economic opportunities and improve lives. I look forward to collaborating closely with this committee going forward to deliver our shared vision, and I look forward to answering your questions this morning. Thank you very much, Chairman. Thank you, Ranking Members. Thank you, Members of the Committee. <clears throat> Mr. Eric Fontworth, Vice President of the Washington Office of the Council of the Americas and the Americas Society. Mr. Eric Fontworth is Vice President of the Washington D.C. Office of the Council of the Americas and the American Society. In government, Mr. Fonsworth has served at the White House, the Office of the U.S. Trade Representative, the State Department, working on post-conflict reconstructions in Panama and Central America, NAFTA and related negotiations, and hemispheric policy development, and implementation during the Clinton administration. He also served as a U.S. consulate in Johannesburg, South Africa. Prior to his current position, Mr. Fonsworth was managing director of the Manat Jones Global Strategies and previously worked at Bristol Myers Squibb and with U.S. Senator Sam Nunn and Congressman John Edward Porter. Mr. Fonsworth, we will. I ask the witnesses to please limit your testimony to five minutes without objection. You are prepared. Your prepared statements written will be made part of the record. Mr. Fonsworth, you are recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, ranking members, members, uh, thank you for the opportunity to, to testify today. Successive U.S. administrations have understood for many years that Central America requires investment, both domestic and foreign, and lots of it, to sustain a positive economic, social, and democratic trajectory. And investment requires expanded trade contributing to job creation. Without the promise of good jobs in the formal economy and the education and training to prepare for such jobs, those with uncertain prospects might be tempted by unpalatable options including criminal actions, drug trafficking, and gang activities, or alternatively, they might choose to migrate seeking a better life in the United States or elsewhere. Congress recognized this connection and passed the CAFTA-DR trade agreement in 2005 but unfortunately, many in Central America believe that CAFTA-DR was the finish line. Rather, CAFTA-DR was a starting line, a concrete means to compete in the global economy without guaranteeing success. The regional business climate required attention and focus, which was not always in evidence. Neither did assistance programs effectively address these issues. Development, accordingly, suffered. Exogenous factors have also contributed to regional underdevelopment, of course, Natural disasters, including hurricanes, and the man-made devastation of drug trafficking, which is facilitated by the regime in Venezuela and exacerbated by weapons trafficking from the United States, have weakened regional economies and social conditions. Crime and criminal behavior have ballooned and threatened to overwhelm state institutions and security in country after country. Corruption is pervasive. COVID hit the region hard. Conversely, the U.S. economy has been a job-creating machine over the past two years, and we are now at full employment with many employers reporting difficulties in hiring qualified workers. Coupled with stagnant regional economies, uncertain job prospects, and high crime and social deterioration in Central America, it should be no surprise that a vibrant U.S. labor market and also perceptions of a more permissive U.S. migration uh, provisions and border enforcement would draw new flows of migrants north which is exactly what we've witnessed. The Biden administration recognizes these persistent, long-running trends and seeks to address irregular migration to the United States by focusing on the root causes of migration, including economic stagnation, lack of jobs in the formal economy that come with state protections and benefits, disaster recovery, lawlessness and criminal abuse, and social challenges. The Vice President has brought high-level attention to these issues, having traveled twice to Central America in the past year, seeking to encourage international investment in the region. She has also announced several initiatives, most recently at the Summit of the Americas in Los Angeles, where I also attended, highlighting impressive private sector commitments to the Northern Triangle. That's all to the good, in my view. But as Chairman Sears has indicated in this hearing already, full implementation of commitments is critical, as is the sustainability of investments over time, particularly given the mixed messages that the private sector has otherwise been receiving about the suitability of investing in the Northern Triangle. 
the expressed reluctance to work with governments and private sector representatives in the Northern Triangle, which are the countries, of course, of El Salvador, Guatemala, and Honduras, resulting from allegations of gross corruption and anti-democratic behavior has been widely acknowledged. These are complex issues, no doubt, but the signals to investors are muddled. So I would propose that we need a paradigm shift. To change behavior, we should change the incentives. We should change the game. We need to onboard local constituencies as allies, using trade as the action-forcing element of the conversation. The key, which is consistent with the administration's broader policy approach toward Latin America and the Caribbean, is to integrate Northern Triangle and Caribbean Basin nations fully within the North American supply chains, as Mr. Ranking Member Green has already indicated. Here's how to do it. With our USMCA partners, we should invite CAF to DR countries to join the USMCA, which is a cutting edge agreement which was passed overwhelmingly on a bipartisan and bicameral basis, but negotiate the terms of a session on a country by country basis, rather than seeking to merge CAF to DR as a bloc into USMCA. Countries that are ready to go early, such as Costa Rica and the Dominican Republic, can join quickly. Others, such as those in the Northern Triangle, would be welcome to join once they prove the ability to meet the obligations of membership. Nicaragua, of course, would not be welcome until returning to the democratic path. Immediately, this would create a race to the top across the region. Countries facing exclusion from the agreement would be motivated to take on necessary reforms and meet existing obligations, including improved rule of law. These would be demanded by internal constituencies, including the domestic private sector, which is now reluctant to uh, participate in some ways because of the impression that everybody's corrupt. But they would then become allies in the fight against corruption, which, because they would otherwise be meaningfully disadvantaged by becoming less competitive with regional peers. Meantime, separate and apart from the United States, to make themselves more attractive to investors, there's a lot that the Northern Triangle nations really can be doing on their own to take steps to make themselves more competitive in a global economy. And frankly, the United States can uh, help in this effort, including our assistance programs toward uh, business facilitation and business climate reforms, which in my view we should be doing. So Mr. Chairman, uh, ranking members, I want to thank you again for the opportunity to testify before you, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you very much. We will now go into questions. I will start with asking questions to our witnesses today. My first question is to all the uh, all the witnesses today. You know, we see some programs that are successful. We see others that are not successful. That I find over the years serving in this committee is sustaining progress and momentum for some of these programs in the future. Because it seems that one administration takes over and they decide to go out a different way. I'm not just talking about the administration in this country, but I'm also talking about administrations in some of these countries. And part of the problem is how do we sustain the most successful programs that we have? when people want to go in a different direction. Can anybody respond to that? Well, I guess I have to call. Yeah. Selena, please. Thank you for your question. I, I think this underscores the need for partnerships, and I think that in, in needs to involve local businesses as well and local actors because that way you also create a demand for these programs and support for these programs at a local level. And that way that can, we've, I mean, we've worked across multiple administrations from different parties in a lot of these, most of these countries, all three of them actually. So I do think that's critical and it's also critical to really involve communities because they can keep it, asking their local government to continue or the partners to continue, the businesses to continue. So I really want to underscore the importance for cross-sector partnerships and ensuring sustainability and also just measurement of impact. So, so we know that things are working as well. Thank you. Mr. Fantini Porter, can you please S help us out with this? Certainly, Chairman. I would echo Selena's point on local partnerships. It's critical and there's no question about that. I would add to that that as we think about this model, for example, of the Partnership for Central America, this is an independent organization. 
which serves solely the purpose of social impact in the region and uh, mobilization of investments, coordination of that impact. So I, I, I think your question is, is so key, Chairman, and that is how do we sustain this impact across parties, across governments, across administrations? And I think that is, that is why this, uh, this partnership, which is so aptly named, serves such a, a valuable, I would offer, purpose in this effort, and that is an independent organization that is helping to coordinate uh, private, public, and social sector organizations to support this, this social impact effort. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Farnsworth, can you, answer, can you help me with that? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. This is a really tough question, not just because, as you've indicated, U.S. administrations change, but local administrations change, and we go back and forth whether or not we want to cooperate with, with them and, frankly, whether they want to cooperate with us. Uh, and it's a two-way street for sure, and sometimes we find that we have uh, so-called partners in the region that really don't want to partner with us. Uh, so it's a complication. Uh, but it takes me back to uh, my points in terms of institutionalizing the economic relationship through trade. Uh, look, we have a terrible relationship with Nicaragua right now uh, because Nicaragua has gone from di democracy to dictatorship. It's a brutal dictatorship, which, which you know all the human rights abuses and, and various things that are going on there right now. And yet, Nicaragua maintains membership in the CAFTA DR. So there is still an institutionality involved in the U.S. relationship with even a brutal dictatorship like Nicaragua. If we want to sustain these relationships with the Northern Triangle over time, my point is that we need to create the incentive structure so that companies will be determined to remain there on a sustainable basis no matter who the government in power is. And unless that government is taking affirmative actions you know, against those companies, that they find it actually in their uh, commercial interest to remain there. I don't think we can do that without a greater institutionalization of the relationship and linking those uh, com uh, companies and investments fully within the North American supply chains. I know that's only a partial answer, but I hope it's at least part of the answer. Well, as far as Nicaragua goes, that just seems to be uh, pulling away more and more from democracy and not dealing with uh, any of the, uh, of any uh, uh, northern uh, countries. I mean, they have uh, 60 minutes did a piece over the weekend, I think, in Nicaragua, and the people that some of them don't even know. So how do you how do you work with these people? How do you try to you know to assist the the community in those places? And that is that is a big problem because it's not that they that we don't want to work with them; it's that they don't want to work with us in many instances, like you just said, Mr. Fontour. So I appreciate that. And I now recognize Ranking Member Green. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and uh, I want to thank you for your bipartisanship. I I, I uh, really appreciate how you've uh, worked with me on particularly the Nearshoring Act. I, I was a little disappointed that uh, none of the Democrat or none of the Republicans got invited to, particularly myself as the Western Hemisphere ranking member, in, invited to the uh, summit of the Americas. That was a little bit disappointing. Uh, you know, bipartisanship is uh, something that's important. It's what our country expects. We're not seeing it right now. Uh, that's not what happened on the Nearshoring Act. We brought that, and you helped me work with uh, with us on that, and I really appreciate you. Uh, but uh, you know, Speaker Pelosi's codel to the summit was 100% Democrats, and that's just quite frankly unacceptable. Um, question for uh, Mr. Fantini Porter: you know, Recently, the Vice President, uh, the U.S. State Department, and the Partnership for Central America announced private sector commitments of slightly more than 3.2 billion. Uh, can you break that down? How much of that is actually commitments that were already on the books, and how much of that $3.2 billion is new since the announcement was made by uh, the Vice President? Thanks. Certainly, Ranking Member. I'll say that each and every one of the commitments that are made and announced and have been since May of 2021 are new commitments. So these are new investments, new social impact programs that are being planned and, and deployed on the ground uh, in Central America. I'll, I'll just say new programs uh, focused on impact. So things like the Cargill and uh, Microsoft commitments, those are all new since the announcement in May of 21. New commitments. Okay, good. Thank you. Um, another question for you um, on pledger investments. Can you kind of share with us how you think they're going to alleviate U.S. border migration flows? I'll say, Ranking Member Green, it's, it's a, I very much respect the question. I'll note that 
as we think about this as an international development effort, which this committee, of course, knows too well from all of the efforts that have been deployed and, and uh, led throughout the world, as an international development effort, it is a long-term effort. And so as we're assessing metrics, we're assessing metrics that align with a long-term international development and economic development effort. I came from Homeland Security. I spent many years there. I understand and very much respect the metrics that are used when we think about enforcement. But I focus, as we think about this as an international development effort, on questions like how many families are being brought into digital inclusion? How many families have been brought into the formal economy through banking and our partners at MasterCard and others? So I, I just offer, if I may, sir, that we're very much focused on those long-term economic development efforts and metrics as we're assessing this effort. I, I mean, I hear that, but you know, the American people, a good chunk of them are losing patience on, uh, on the flows. And, you know, if you look at, I know my colleague mentioned two million measurable, it's if you do the other people that are sort of going around, they call them getaways, whatever, it's about 3.3 million this year, right? So uh, if, you, if you look at the states in the United States, 21 states have fewer people in the populations than 3.3 million. That means we're bringing in every year of this administration another entire state, a moderate-sized state. Um, and so saying, well, this is a long term, we're going to develop metrics over time, the American people are losing their patience with that. And uh, just one caveat to you there. Um, Mr. Farnsworth, uh, how should the U.S. leverage our U.S.-Mexico relationship to promote investment and economic opportunity in Central America? I think it's a great question, uh, and it's an important question. Uh, by definition, uh, the U.S. relationship with Central America is going to touch on the U.S. relationship with Mexico, and Mexico is Central America. Just look at the map. Yep. Uh, so you've got it. Uh, but, you know, it's interesting here because this is one area where the president of Mexico, with whom we have differences, uh, has nonetheless expressed a real desire for partnership with the United States, which is to say development not just in southern Mexico, but also development in Central America. And it's his... Uh, one of his priorities, it's also an area where we have expressed real interest for the migration issue and others, and so there's a natural partnership here. Uh, and in fact, you've heard U.S. officials uh, talk about it, you've heard uh, Mexican officials talk about it. Uh, I'd like to see a lot more concrete done on it. Uh, you know, let's get beyond the rhetoric and let's move to concrete actions. Uh, Would you do me a favor and sort of ch share your top five ideas on that with me in writing? I'm running out of time today. because. If you look at the press, the relations with the U.S. and AMLO, I mean, the president of Mexico are just, I mean, it, it doesn't look good. And I'd love your top five ideas, so send them to me in writing. I'd be delighted. Thank you. Thank you. I yield. For five minutes. I assume you called on me. I think you're... You got cut off there a bit. Uh, thank you, Chairman. It's great to host this hearing. Thank you to our witnesses for being here, for all of your work, uh, for being engaged so strongly on this issue. Uh, I think that no matter where we fall on the political spectrum in this country, I think we have a desire that people in their own countries be able to live there safely, be able to live there and prosper, hopefully be able to live there in a democratic nation that respects their rights. I also think, conversely, that for the most part, People around the world want to stay in their homes. I don't think they want to trek a thousand miles with a kid or two in tow uh, in a dangerous path to try to come to the United States, really, or any other country in the world. And so I start from those two uh, bases. Um, and so, so thank you for that work. Uh, I also think that um, it, it doesn't do us any good to, to think of these people only as dangerous people who are coming here to hurt people. Uh, when we do that, first of all, we dehumanize them, but it's also not realistic. You know, all the numbers that we've seen show that immigrants to this country actually commit crime at a lower rate than native-born Americans. Um, and so it's dangerous for us to constantly paint these people as just dangerous people uh, who are coming here to hurt us. Um, uh, for example, in 2019, I was in a uh, Border Patrol facility in Texas with 20 Cuban women who had migrated from Cuba to the United States, uh, fleeing an oppressive situation in Cuba. 
I think that those women and their stories, the reasons they were leaving, were similar to what you would have found uh, of people fleeing 40 years ago or from Cuba or 50 years ago from Cuba, except 40 years ago, the United States would have welcomed them in, and what changed in the, in the intervening time is that wet foot, dry foot ended, right? So the policy ended. So now you had, instead of these 20 women being welcomed in the United States, uh, they were being held in a small cell uh, with one toilet for 20 people, right? Uh, and so I want to ask you about your work uh, and how it's going. It, can you provide some examples in more detail on how the Partnership for Central America is coordinating with the State Department, USAID, DFC, MCC, and other government entities? In other words, we want this work to be well coordinated. I know, you know Representative Green expressed that there is a frustration uh, we want our government agencies to work together to be coordinated for this effort to be successful. Uh, how is that work coming? Chairman, I think it's coming very well, uh, along very well. The, this sort of change doesn't happen, as, as we know, without a systemic approach. There's just no question about it. It requires a full coordination across sectors, private, public, and social sector. And the public sector, inevitably, uh, both in host countries as well as the United States government, is just a critical, critical partner to this. And so the, the relationship that we have with the State Department and USAID is, is lockstep, I would say, in terms of our efforts. Um, we are, I will note uh, very sincerely, an independent organization, of course, but our relationship and our coordination with the State Department and USAID on this effort has been one, I think, of, of a role model for how efforts like this could potentially be deployed. And that is an MOU with both of those organizations, those entities, um, ongoing coordination when it comes to uh, the, the communications and the structuring of this effort and how we build this effort. And as we think about this, at the end of the day, the very focused impact of this effort. And that's where I, I think that coordination has been so key. It's identifying how we, uh, I, how we identify the individuals that we are hoping to help in the region most effectively across sectors. I'll say that the relationship has been, I'll, I'll note again, a model in many ways, I think, for how a public, private, and social sector partnership can, uh, can play out. Well, thank you. I have one more question, but just wanted to, to answer. I know um, uh, my ranking member on my subcommittee, Representative Mali Takis, asked an important question about why we're focusing on this and not on some of the other issues. And remember, this is the Foreign Affairs Committee. The Foreign Affairs Committee focuses on our relations with other countries and how we can solve problems, hopefully, together. We have a whole committee on homeland security that handles our threats to our homeland and to the border. So as you know, those hearings are quite frequent over on the Homeland Security Committee on the issues that you discussed. Uh, so let me ask one more question. How are PCA members consulting with and including civil society organizations and local communities to ensure these investments are effectively addressing the issues being faced? And I only got about 15 seconds, so I'll have to take most of it for the record. But uh, absolutely. I'll, I'll just say uh, this is very much a public, private, and social sector effort, Chairman. So the social sector is fully involved, whether it's Acción or CARE USA, two of the largest NGOs in this space. They are integrated in this partnership just as much as any public and private partner. We are a public, private, and social sector effort, sir. Thank you. Are oh, you back, Chairman? Oh, I'm fine. Thanks. We recognize now Congresswoman Meliotakis. Uh, thank you very much. And uh, just to, to respond to my uh, chairman's comments, look, there's no doubt that there are very good people who are trying to enter this country to achieve the American dream, and there's a broken system. But there's also people who are being exploited. They're being taken advantage of. We went to the border. We saw a young girl crying because she had been gang raped along the journey. That is the stuff that we cannot be turning a blind eye on, and unfortunately, this administration with their open border policy has incentivized that type of illegal activity that is leading to horrific things happening to people along the journey, as well as um, the amount, as I said, illegal activity taking place, entering our country with drugs and, and what's, so on. But to turn to... Um, the question I wanted to ask was for Mr. Farnsworth. I'm curious what your opinion is of the fact that Mexico, El Salvador, Honduras, Guatemala, they've all boycotted the Summit of Americas. So not only were Republicans not invited, but these countries that we are you know, giving billions of dollars to to try to work with us to resolve this issue decided that they didn't even want to come to meet with our president. What does that say to you and, and people who are, who are saying that this is a, a good idea to give them billions more? 
I think it's an important question, and uh, it was a disappointment that uh, those four leaders chose not to come to the Summit of the Americas. They were invited. Uh, and for, in fact, as I understand it, the Biden administration bent over backward to try to encourage each one to come to Los Angeles uh, for the meetings. Each one is a sovereign leader. Uh, they made decisions based on different reasons and different rationales. I was particularly disappointed that the president of Honduras didn't come, uh, in part because the vice president of the United States went to her inauguration, which is something you don't see a lot in terms of Latin America, a U.S. vice president going to a presidential inauguration in the region. It just doesn't happen that often. It was a signal of real interest in Honduras. It was not reciprocated, and that was a real disappointment, and we still don't really know why. Uh, El Salvador, Guatemala had their own reasons. The president of Mexico uh, expressed his uh, support for having uh, Cuba, Venezuela, and Nicaragua, three brutal dictatorships, at the summit, uh, which was contrary to the Inter-American Democratic Charter, which all the countries of the, of the hemisphere have signed, except for Cuba, uh, indicating, indeed, that the summits of the Americas are reserved only for democratically elected leaders. So this was also a bit of a disappointment, uh, and uh, one that, uh, you know, I think it just shows that we have a lot of work to do to continue to build that relationship over time. And um, you mentioned Cuba. Venezuela and Nicaragua is the reason why uh, some of those countries decided to boycott. Um, I will say that, you know, we saw what happened in Colombia now, a leftist government there for the first time. Uh, Venezuela and Cuba are continuing to spread their influence of communism throughout the entire region of Central America and South America. Very concerning. It's a very concerning thing. So the next question is, corporations, private companies, I mean, when they see this spread of communism, taking place in Central and South America, is that going to deter them from wanting to invest? I mean, you want stability, right? You want to make sure you have a fair judicial system. You want to make sure they're not packing the court like Venezuela did, right, where they had, went from 20 to 32 justices in 45,000 cases. All of a sudden, went in Maduro, and then, uh, uh, I mean, um, Chavez in the Maduro's favor, and they destroyed the richest country in South America and all its economic opportunity. How does that play into the thought process of trying to attract private investment into that area? I can tell you it's a disincentive, uh, uh, you know, in a very real way. Um, look, there are a lot of reasons why companies will invest in individual companies, in, in individual countries, uh, based on their own dynamics, based on global markets, based on whatever their, the metrics they're using. But the overriding political environment is also key. And to the extent that that is unstable, or to the extent that it may be stable, but it's in a, it goes in, going in a direction where the private sector is getting squeezed, or uh, you know, uh, state uh, presence in the economy is increasing in a significant manner. Companies very much take that under, uh, into account in terms of whether they invest, not just new investment, but whether they continue to invest in the, in the country. And so what we've seen across Latin America is a real lag compared to global economies, right? I mean, Latin America should be doing so much better comparatively on a global basis, and in many ways it just has lagged. Uh, obviously the comparison is Asia, the comparison is Western Europe, et cetera, et cetera. But we're not dealing anymore with local uh, geographic areas in terms of investment. We're dealing in a global economy. And one of the things that countries in the region still have not fully internalized necessarily is that they're competing for marginal dollars of investment in a very competitive global environment. And so if you have a government that comes in and the first thing is to talk about expropriations or to talk about, you know, changing the tax code in a very arbitrary manner or rewriting constitutions in a way that might be arbitrary and, and disadvantageous to companies who made billions of dollars of investment in a, in a, on an expectation that that would be sustainable over time, that's going to have real world implications. And indeed, that's what we've seen in the region over time. Thank you. Thank you. I now recognize Congressman Levin for five minutes. Thanks so much to you, Chair Series, and to Chair Castro, and to both ranking members uh, for holding this hearing today. I really appreciate the opportunity to discuss Vice President Harris's call to action to increase private investment in the Northern Triangle. I believe that while this region has suffered from misguided U.S. foreign policy in the past, we have an opportunity to shift our approach particularly under Vice President Harris's and Special Envoy John Kerry's leadership. Specifically, 
With the Northern Triangle becoming ground zero for the impacts of climate change in the Americas and a major driver of outmigration, I believe the U.S. should pilot a big, bold, zero to net zero green energy strategy in the region that brings together governments, industry, labor unions, and workers. My questions focus on some of the challenges and opportunities for getting such a strategy off the ground. Mr. Fantini Porter, with the participation of major multinational corporations, the Partnership for Central America has helped What's enable that? significant investment across Northern Triangle countries, commendable in the face of low FDI rates in the region generally. With that in mind, how do labor standards and human rights protections play into your decisions to partner with companies? Congressman, thank you for the question. It's an incredibly important one. It's one that I, I fully understand. Um, I'll say, and just to start by saying that this effort begins with a foundation. Mr. Fantini of Porter, I can't hear you. I'm sorry, Congressman. I, I, the microphone's on. I'm not sure if there's a technical issue on one side. Are you able to hear now? Mr. Chairman, can you hear him? We can hear him here, yes. Congressman, I, I might proceed if it makes sense. I'm not sure if you're able to hear now. Congressman Levin. Yes, now I can. Great. Congressman, you're able to hear now? My apologies, Congressman. The microphone is working on this end. I think everyone in this room is able to hear. Uh, the chairman, I think, is able to hear as well. No, I'm not hearing anything. Can anyone hear? <laughs> no. We can hear, Congressman. We're having issues on our side with the microphone. Please. Thanks, Max. They're having technical issues. We could hear you. She couldn't hear him. Couldn't hear. Could you clearly hear? Congressman, I'm being advised to try the microphone again. Not sure if you're able to hear, sir. I hear you. Can you hear me? I can hear you very well, sir. Thank you. I think our technical issue is resolved. I'll proceed to answer your question, if I may. Um, Congressman, your Thank question you. is, is a critical one, and it's one that we are fully aligned with in, in a sense of how we are prioritizing this effort. I'll start by saying that this effort begins with the foundation of core values centered on human dignity, economic empowerment, environmental protection, worker rights and anti-corruption. We achieve the impact we've laid out through corporate social responsibility and responsible corporate uh, social, uh, citizenship. It's why, for example, we've created the first rule of law pledge that creates a good governance club for responsible corporate partners in the region. To your question specifically, Congressman, labor and worker rights is key for our organization as well. And I'll say, you know, they, at a personal level and at an organizational level, as a, as a son of a refugee who left Latin America to escape the violence that, that uh, my, my father was facing, the realities of that environment. Protecting the most vulnerable is core to our organization's belief system. Our COO is, is also a former Peace Corps volunteer. 
The, the values that are, I think are at the root of your question are critical to what we aspire to, to deploy and to build in Central America, and that is a, a region in which, empowered by economic empowerment, job creation, digital inclusion, financial inclusion, workers are able to have a decent life with their families and are able to avoid the, the, un, the un, unnecessary and, and tragic circumstances that often uh, come with migration north. So our intention, sir, is to create a environment in uh, northern Central America with our corporate and social partners that reflects the dignity, I think, at the, the root of your question. Great. All right. Well, I'll look forward to following along and, and hearing more uh, as we go forward. Ms. DeSola, your nonprofit operates across the Northern Triangle. I have no doubt that each country has its own challenges. Can you illuminate any themes across the three countries that prevent Glasswing International from seeing longer term gains from the programs that you establish there? And your testimony also advocates for incentivizing companies to engage with local civil society organizations to better address local priorities. I'm glad to see USAID is focusing on that. So I'd like you to address that as well. Can you share some of the best practices you've seen from your work about how companies have adopted locally led models for development and investing? Thank you, Congressman Levin. That's actually exactly right. I think when companies have really committed to this long term and engage their employees, who many of whom are from these communities, I think that tends to improve not just the impact, but the sustainability. And it also integrates these companies, whether they're multinational or local, more into communities. And that, that creates a, a more sustained partnership um, because it is a, it's everybody wins, right? Um, when all these different stakeholders are involved, um, I think the more the more localized these strategies can be, the better. Because even you know, there's central government that can change, local government can change, but there are people who work within these institutions that work across different administrations. So when you get at the operational level, the involvement of different stakeholders, it's also um, a powerful tool for sustaining these long term. All right, thanks, Mr. Chairman. I think my time's expired. I appreciate your patience. Take, Thank and I you. Back. Good night for five minutes. Th thank you. Did you say Congressman Issa? No, I said Tenny. Tenny. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Chairman Castro and uh, Chairman Sears. I, I didn't hear, I thought you said Issa. I apologize. Uh, I just want to thank you to the witnesses. I just have a question I want to first address to Mr. Farnsworth. Uh, Mexico's President uh, Lopez Obrador is pursuing a foreign policy that is confrontational, obviously, to the United States, to democracy, uh, to free markets. We see the rising uh, trade tensions, record levels of Americans are overdosing, border encounters continuing to rise at historic levels. How can the Vice President achieve progress in Central America considering the deteriorating U.S.-Mexico relationship? And I know you've addressed the border, but if you could just do it again in, in relation to that issue, because I've got a quick follow-up for you on that. Thanks for the question. This was the basis of uh, Ranking Member Green's uh, question as well. How can the United States and Mexico cooperate on Central America? And I think the short answer is this is a real priority of the President of Mexico. So we have some real disagreements with the President of Mexico, no doubt. Environment, uh, uh, economy, mm -hmm. uh, you know, border issues, migration, all these things. But one of the priorities that he himself has expressed is to work together with the United States for development uh, in southern Mexico, but also Central America. And my view is we should take him up on it. Uh, and there are ways to really uh, bring together the economies of Mexico in Central America to promote integration into the North American supply chains. And in so doing, what we'll do is not just be cooperating with Mexico, but we'll also be helping to develop Central America in the way that we've been trying to talk about today that will hopefully limit uh, some of the uh, impulse to migrate. One of my concerns, and I lived in the former Yugoslavia, so uh, people think of it as a benevolent dictatorship, communism light, a lot of those things, but many people don't talk about the barren island called Goli Otak, which was a gulag, a prison for uh, dissidents, uh, that people were sent there, even under the beloved Tito leadership, who was you know, a, a self-proclaimed uh, communist. But the Mexican president recently boycotted the Summit of the Americas because the Cubans, Venezuelan, Nicaraguan communists weren't invited. How do we deal with this again, once again, this communist threat that's 
uh, pervasive now, and then the influence of communist regimes like China and and other authoritarian type regimes in, with their ability economically to move into South America and other continents in the world. That's a real challenge, and uh, yes, you're right. That was his stated reason for not attending the Summit of the Americas. I think many of us were disappointed by that. Uh, the Summit of the Americas is specifically a body or a, a group of uh, democratically elected leaders that's been institutionalized in the Inter-American Democratic Charter, uh, which is ratified by all countries in the region except for Cuba. Uh, and so, uh, look, if we want to engage with some of these countries, there are ways to do it, but, but not in the Summit of the Americas. So I think that was probably the wrong target to shoot at, and it was unfortunate that he chose, in my view, that it was unfortunate he chose to do it. The larger issue here, though, is one that we've seen across the region, and we just saw elections in Colombia on Sunday. You have a scenario where the established political parties are just simply not being perceived to be meeting the needs of the people. Uh, and it's not necessarily a shift to the right or the left or the this or the that. It's an anti-incumbency. People are just tossing the bums out. They're saying, look, you didn't provide for my needs. I need, to, I need something different. And so there's a willingness to take a risk in country after country of non-institutional leaders and leaders who are promising things that in many, uh, you know, many aspects may never be able to be realized, uh, but the promises sound good. And it's what the people are looking to hear. How can the United States respond to that? I think you know, one of the things that I was hoping to come out of the Summit of the Americas was a robust, ambitious, economic engagement agenda led by the United States with willing partners in the region. We Wait, let me ask, so we've had decades of foreign assistance uh, demonstrated that just the aid alone is not what's doing it. They're obviously being influenced by other forces, other economic strengths and authoritarianism. Um, what, are, what can we do in terms of our, of our foreign aid? Uh, what reforms are necessary? For example, in Central America, how can we promote better business investment that encourages individual rights and freedom and entrepreneurship as opposed to you know, supplanting or propping up these authoritarian sort of communist-like socialist regimes? I'd very much like our assistance programs to be focused on, economic, on uh, uh, business uh, development in the context of creating the conditions mm -hmm. that will sustain the investments over time. Let me just give you a couple very quick uh, okay, you know, examples. You know, things that businesses look at tax policies, permitting policies, uh, appropriateness of infrastructure, regulatory convergence. I mean, in the, in the Northern Triangle countries, we have three small economies individually trying to compete in the global economy. Why haven't we seen a greater convergence among those three countries themselves on regulatory convergence, on harmonizing their own economies to make the investor not just look at El Salvador, which is a, really not a very large economy, but the larger economy of an integrated Northern Triangle. Once we start talking in those terms and integrate with Southern Mexico and Northern North American supply chains, you begin to have an, eco an economies of scale that is on its face much more attractive to potential investors as opposed to each country competing for that investment on its own. I appreciate that. And having a, a, an intern from Venezuela who is a, a freedom lover was really an insight for me uh, last year. But I want to thank you. My time's expired. Appreciate the comments and I yield my time back. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. We now recognize Congressman Oma for five minutes. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, in March, I led several of my colleagues on a delegation to Honduras and Guatemala. Uh, we met with government officials in both countries, and we spent several days meeting with indigenous and campesino communities. As you might expect, the root causes of migration were a re recurring theme uh, of our meetings. I have to tell you all, um, what I heard in those communities was completely different um, than what we're hearing from you today. Uh, what we heard was a lot of stories about transnational private investments being a root cause of migration. It was mining companies in Guatemala, a silver mining co company in La Puya, where um, communities would get two to three hours access to water in every 48 hours because of this mining company. It was energy companies in Honduras, cryptocurrency in El Salvador, sweatshops and agricultural companies in all three countries. This is obviously a very, uh, very complex, but we heard about mega projects displacing communities, about labor exploitation, about corporations making promises of community development that were never kept. So you will have to forgive me, Mr. Um, Fantini-Porter, if I'm a little skeptical 
about uh, this round of corporate promises. Help me understand how this is different than previous efforts to increase private sector investment in Central America and how you are factoring in a history of corruption and labor exploitation. And if you could be brief, please. Certainly. Congresswoman, thank you for the question. I think it's a critical one. Uh, and it's understanding what the values are of these organizations that are involved here. I'll say at a, at a personal and organizational level, this Partnership for Central America is a values first organization, right? So it's about environmental protections, it's about worker rights, it's about dignity of life, it's about how we partner in a systemic way to bring our private sector partners who are focused in a socially responsible way on having impact in a region of the world where you have 30 percent of of families living in extreme poverty, 50 percent of children suffering from malnutrition and stunting and the like. There is a desperate, as you know and I know you saw in Honduras and in Guatemala, a desperate need for aid and support. And so in any way that we can identify partners that are willing to support in achieving the social impact goals that you, I know, if I may say, have for that region and that we share very much, we're focused on that. So, you know, I, I'll say, the, the organizations that we've partnered with are carefully selected. We have a vetting process in place. Yeah, so let, let, let yeah, me sure. um, maybe ask you, what, what are the metrics that you are using uh, to determine what investments have been successful? Uh, and is it only about reducing out migration um, or is it more than that? Because in La Puya, in uh, Guatemala, you know, many of the mothers that we talked to talked about how their young children left because life is not sustainable there. And you have a transatlantic corporation that is investing um, in silver mining there, but the community in itself uh, is devastated because of it. I think it's important, if I may, Congressman, Congresswoman, to just note the, the distinction between organizations, right? I, I would just offer, if I may, that we can't generalize, with all due respect, generalize an entire sector. There are different organizations that have different intentions and different business practices. So for example, as I think about Microsoft, Microsoft has invested to support bringing digital inclusion to 4 million families in the region. In the last 12 months, Congresswoman, we've brought 1.96 million people onto the, uh, into the digital access that previously hadn't. With MasterCard and other partners, 310,000 individuals now have access to the formal, formal economy. 12 months ago, they did not. That means access to credit, that means formal bank accounts, 12 months. That's quick, it's significant, and it delivers real impact to families there. So what I will say is, I think the root of your question, if I may, Congresswoman, is what are the values that we are driving in this organization? And the values are human dignity, social impact. And so we are carefully, carefully selecting the partners that we work with in that effort. And I'll note, the partners that we have brought on have delivered now in the last 12 months $3.2 billion dollars in foreign direct investment and support I, in the region. I appreciate your answer, and I would love to sure. follow up um, in the future, but I, I really wanted to quickly um, get get in this one question to Ms. De Sola. Uh, one of the concerns I've heard from um, El, Salvador, El Salvadoran civil society is that some U.S. aid partners are too close to Pukele government and to Pukele himself. Uh, what is Glasswing's relationship with Pukele? Thank you, Congressman Omar. We're an independent organization uh, and always have been for 15 years. So we've been working across every administration since we started the organization in collaboration with um, maintaining our independence. So in order to reach, just like you said uh, before, in order to reach as many of these women, young people and children, uh, we, we do collaborate with ministries of education, ministries of health, and, and there's people who form part of these teams. So we work independently in collaboration with both private sector and uh, government, government stakeholders. Mm -hmm. Good, thank, uh, you. Uh, thank you. Thank, thank you. I yield back. Yeah. Congressman Ice, are you there? I sure am. All right, good. You're on for five minutes. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Uh, Farnsworth, in the last six months, have you met with the Vice President? Have I? No, sir. No. Mr. Fentini Porter, have you met with uh, the Vice President in the last six months? I have, Congressman. Yes. Uh, does it surprise you that you're here and she's not, and no one from the administration is here? Congressman, I can't speak to who was invited to a congressional hearing, but I can certainly say that from the partnerships... Well, you've been saying all day, we, 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 but... 
the we is the federal government, correct? Your, your, your program is sponsored by the U.S. government? That, that is not correct, sir. The Partnership for Central America is an independent non-governmental organization. You receive grants? We do not. We're then an independent non-governmental organization. Okay, so you're talking about private sector investment that doesn't have any federal backing. What we are, sir, if I may, with all due respect, sir, and I, and I know you come from a significant private sector background, and I respect that very much. We're an organization, Congressman Issa, that is focused on mobilizing and coordinating foreign direct investment into the region, full stop. So if I may, sir, what we're trying to do is bring together private sector organizations, large private sector multinational organizations to make investments in the region. Last 12 months, $3.2 billion mobilized in that region, where, if I may, with all respect, sir, say that's a significant difference from past efforts. But to your I, point. And I appreciate the, your nature of, of, of always thinking something significant. Uh, Mr. Uh, Farnsworth, would you invest in the, in the triangle right now? I'd like to have something to invest <laughs> in terms of my personal. That's just a joke, sir, uh, and not a very good one. Um, look, people have different reasons for investing in different areas. It's a complicated region. Uh, okay. but, but currently, it's, it's, not, it's not on a high list of, of good return on investment, particularly Nicaragua where you don't know whether you're going to get to keep your, what you invest. Uh, I, I wouldn't invest in Nicaragua, no. That's a brutal dictatorship. Okay, yeah. so we've at least taken care of part of that. Yeah. Um, let me, uh, you know, obviously I'm deeply disappointed that uh, the vice president has not addressed this group or any of the members, at least on my side of the aisle. Uh, you know, she is the czar for this, what we're talking about today, uh, and that development, I guess, according to... Uh, Mr. Uh, uh, Fantini Porter, you know, she's responsible for, I just would like to see somebody from the administration just once come here to answer our questions. You, uh, you talked about uh, the, the situation at the border. Let me, let me go through a, a couple of quick questions, um, and primarily for uh, Mr. Farnsworth, but I'll take other answers. Is there anyone here today that believes that the seven billion, six and a half to seven billion people who live in comparative poverty, that any of our programs are overnight going to eliminate that six, six and a half billion people who live at a dramatically different economic level to the United States? Overnight, no. Okay, uh, in a year? I don't believe so. In five years? I can't say, but I don't think so. Okay, well, since... Uh, 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 since the beginning of the New Testament, has there ever been a time in which there were not areas of poverty and areas of comparative wealth, in which the world all was equalized so there'd be no reason for a migra migratory change for economic opportunity? Pro probably not since the Garden. Okay, so if we have t t uh, 2,000 years that we have not had that perfect equality, I'm going to predict that in the next six months, two years, five years, or at least as long as... Uh, this administration is in power, we're not going to have that. So I'm going to go back to something that you concentrated on that this committee doesn't seem to want to deal with. Can we sustain an economic border pol a policy at our border that promotes out-migration of motivated people from countries, every country of the world practically at this point, but particularly the region we're talking about? of South and Central America. I think you're pointing to a very important issue which we have only touched on in this hearing, and that is the disparity between the strong U.S. and North American economy and the relatively weak economies to, to our South. And there is a very real pull factor in the context of migration uh, incentives. Look, if you don't have a, a job or you want a better job, your community's circumstances may not be great, all the circumstances we've been talking about already, but you have the United States with a booming economy. We can't find enough. Right, work. but I'm going to just focus on one question for you uh, in the remaining time. Out migration, and we'll assume for a moment that the best and the brightest, the most motivated, are who's coming here from these countries. Out migration, does, isn't that adverse to the very nature of investing in a country? If I'm going to invest in a country in South or Central America, don't I want a workforce that inherently I can count on their being there 
rather than the continued out-migration that our open board policy provides. I think it's a really interesting point. And one of the things we say all the time is that, uh, you know, the worst resource to lose from your population, uh, from your country, is your population. That's your seed corn. Those are the, th that's how you grow your economy, is with talented, educated individuals. And absolutely, if you're losing those folks, that's a gain to the U.S., but it's a loss for the sending economies. Mr. fantini Potter, you seem to want to answer also. Uh, certainly, sir, if, if, if you'd like. Um, you know, I, th I think that the root of the question ends up, perhaps if I may, just uh, blending two different topics, and that is a short-term question of border enforcement and a long-term effort of international development, sir. And as I sit here before the subcommittee of the of a House Foreign Affairs Committee, I reflect on the fact that this long-term effort is focused on metrics that align with that. So how do we focus on an effort that in the end of the day is intended to achieve impact in the long term? Acknowledging, sir, with absolute respect that there are short-term fluctuations in migration, which will continue with absolute certainty, sir, but that as we think about this as a long-term effort, Thank you. we are putting our best foot forward to try to bring this forward. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, for your indulgence. Yield back. Congresswoman Spamberger, you are recognized for five minutes. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, certainly when I travel across our district, I hear from constituents who are frustrated by the ongoing crisis at the southern border. You know, my constituents, like so many Americans, expect a secure border. They expect... Uh, and, and they are right to expect lawful immigration system that works. Uh, protecting our borders is really a matter of national uh, security, um, and we must have lawful and orderly channels within our immigration system. I have long supported hiring more uh, custom and border patrol officers, common sense improvements to address the immigration backlog. Um, but I come at this question as a former intelligence officer and uh, for a time worked uh, transnational criminal organizations throughout Central and South America. Um, and I know that we just can't wait for the problems to turn into a crisis at the border, that some of the root challenges that you know are the topic of this hearing, uh, we can't just wait for that to mean uh, people fleeing from national, natural disasters, people looking for economic opportunity, people f fleeing rampant lawlessness um, and trying to create a better life for their families. Um, and so addressing these root causes really has to be a central part of the strategy that we, the United States, employs. Um, so I appreciate this hearing. I had a couple follow-up questions on some of the topics that have been brought up. Um, Mr. Farnsworth, I believe it was you who talked about USMCA and, and the comments about bringing in Central American countries I found to be uh, pretty interesting. Um, could you comment a little bit, because I, I am curious whether or not such a proposal, as you mentioned, bringing Central American countries in on a country-by-country country negotiation basis, how, what would the impact be potentially for wealthier, more stable countries like Panama versus far more economically um, or uh, unstable countries uh, like some of the others. Could you comment on that? Thanks for the question. Uh, first of all, clarification, Panama is not part of the CAFTA-DR. They have a separate bilateral trade. So you're speaking States. specifically of CAFTA-DR yes, countries. Yes, but having said uh, that, would be open to a broader approach as well, including Panama and other U.S. free trade partners uh, in the Americas for sure. Um, but in the context of uh, divergence in the region itself, it's a reality. I mean, Costa Rica, for example, is the wealthiest country in Central America, as you know, and uh, probably one of the most ready, along with the Dominican Republic, of the CAFTA-DR partners uh, to move early into the space. Uh, and they would get a first mover benefit, absolutely, because investors will take that as, if I can use the cliche, good, good housekeeping seal of approval, and to say, look, the United States, there's, there's rule of law, there's institutionality, uh, there's recourse to, you know, uh, adjudication for disputes, and, et cetera. And in doing it that way, as, as you propose, as you're thinking about it, does that create a disadvantage for other countries, or does that create... I, my, my view, and the argument, is that it actually creates an incentive for the other countries to get their act together. Because if they don't, they fall further and further behind. So let's play this out. Let's say you have, I don't just pick two countries, CR, you know, Costa Rica and the Dominican Republic. Yeah. Let's say they move first. They then get the early mover advantage of investors, but you have the Guatemalas, El Salvadors, and the Hondurases of the world who would say, look, we need to be at the same level, otherwise our investments are going to suffer by definition. Uh, and so you build those internal constituencies, particularly in the private sector, which gets in the face of its own government and says, get your act together. We need to have that access to the North American supply chains because we are falling behind. They're doing it for commercial and, and parochial reasons, no doubt. 
but at the same time it has public policy implications. And one of the things we have not done, in my view, in Central America very well is to get the local constituencies on board with our agenda. In fact, in many cases we've ignored the local constituencies, tried to work around them, called them names, called them corrupt, etc. We and, need to change and when you're that. Can you define a little bit further for the sake of this discussion, who are the local constituencies that you're talking about? Local private sector entities, uh, in some cases governments for sure, mm -hmm. uh, even some of the NGO community. There's a lot of really good work happening right now in the Northern Triangle that's, that's created by the countries in question and the communities in question that simply is not being incorporated because we have a different approach. Okay, fair enough, but I can tell you because I've had personal conversations with multiple uh, folks in this regard, it's also causing resentment in the region and it's causing defensiveness and saying, why aren't you working with us? We're the local community, mm -hmm. right? You're, you're disavowing us, you're calling us names. We want to be part of the solution and we can be part of the solution and frankly, there is no solution apart from the local private sector and the local constituency. So we have to find a way to change that dynamic. And specific to the USMCA example that you brought, that you mentioned of bringing in the Kafka DR countries, um, have you spoken with people on the ground who are specifically interested in USMCA? What, what have those conversations been like? There, there's real enthusiasm yeah. for the idea of finding a way to link judicially and legally into North American supply chains for a sustainable long-term approach. There is some concern uh, among some parties in terms of some of the provisions of USMCA, right? Labor and environment and enforceability and all those things. Fair enough, yep. that's what negotiations are for. But it's also the way, if I can say, for the United States to now promote with positive incentives rather than sanctions and, and you know name calling, the agenda and the values that we are seeking to promote. So we've changed the incentive structure and we've built a new constituency to align with what we're actually trying to achieve. Because we've changed the framework of the yeah. conversation. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. Thank, thank you, sir. All right. Thank you again to our witnesses and the members for joining us in this important hearing. Stemming the flow of irregular migration from Central America will require long-term commitment from the United States to deepen our diplomatic and foreign assistance efforts. I look forward to working closely with my colleagues and the Biden administration to help foster the necessary political and economic conditions whereby citizens through the region can imagine a future in their own home countries. With that, the committee is adjourned. Thank you.